I'd like to call the Board of Education meeting for Tuesday, July 22nd, 2014 to order. Can I have a roll call please, Madam Clerk? Mrs. Fisher? Here. Mr. Schuler? Here. Mrs. Clemenson? Here. Mr. Borkowski? Here. Mr. Lemke? Here. Mr. Folker? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, Ms. Fowler. We are going to begin this evening with the President's report, and in lieu of Mr. Anderson's absence, he has asked me to give a President's report, which I will affectionately call the Vice President's report. <laughs> Last August, I had the opportunity to welcome our staff back to school. The students hadn't yet entered the buildings, and the walls and classrooms, minus stacked chairs and tables, were fairly desolate. The slate was clean, and all things were possible. So here we are once again. The summer is nearing its end. Family vacations, camps, and neighborhood barbecues will be replaced with bustling hallways, re-energized sports fields, and not so beloved early morning bells. The school calendar innately offers a rarely found opportunity for a true do-over. As students remove the packaging of new folders and reflect on novels recently read at their leisure, teachers are preparing lessons infused with creative ideas found through summer curriculum work and continuing personal and professional development. While the fall offers excitement and hope, without ample and focused preparation, this valuable opportunity to restart can be wasted. But it won't be. With great confidence, I can say our destination is clear. We, as a board and as a community, have created a vision that clearly identifies where we want to go. Over the past few months, while students have had time to participate in a myriad of experiences, the district has been working to make the 2014-2015 school year one of growth for students and staff alike. We have seen the addition of roles, building math specialists, a consultant to assist us in gathering and deciphering me metrics, and a director of student learning, just to name a few. Shifts in administrative duties and selections of instructional tools and modalities have been made, have ma have been made be to better align us with our vision. The past year, frankly, was not easy. It was filled with important listening, dissection, reflection, and decision making. The previous year, though, has District 67 poised for a year of progress. The high expectations that August brings in the world of education will be palpable as our students and teachers fill our buildings once again. As potential meets thoughtful, clear, and responsible planning, our, st our staff and students are afforded the engagement, growth, and limitless possibilities they deserve. Thank you. Now we are going to move on to the superintendent's report. Mr. Simic. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher, and I'll add to a couple of the comments that you made, uh, one of those being about the uh, expert in uh, student metrics and achievement, and uh, a couple of things at the end of my report that will link to that. So, in, And uh, my report is going to be talking about the extension of the mission, vision, milestones. So in April, the Board of Education approved the mission and vision milestones, and it bears reviewing the purpose of each of those things. The mission is why an organization exists, and the vision is who the organization wants to be in 10 years. And milestones are things that will be true along the way if we are accomplishing our vision. The administration was charged with creating strategies and tactics to make the milestones a reality, or those markers along the way towards achieving the vision. Literally the day after school ended, 55 teachers, LFEA representatives, administrators, community members, and board members, including Mrs. Fisher, from Districts 65, 67, and 115 came together to plan the work of the future. That work began with a data set for groups to review and consider as they looked at what was next. They then drafted what will be a working document for the summer, which has been distributed to the, uh, to the participants already which administrators will review, triage, and capture a more refined version of that work. And then on August 11, that same group will reconvene as part of our annual two-day administrative advance meeting. Notably, this is the first time that teachers have been invited to participate in these meetings. It has been in my experience that teachers add greatly to making better plans. And as the Harvard Business Review stated in a recent issue, show me a company where the doers are different than the planners and we'll show you a company where what gets done is different than what got planned. 
The timing of this meeting was important and also very intentional. It was designed to capture people's interest and energies immediately after the school year ended, to give them time to think about things over the summer and for administrators to work on that document over the entire summer. In any industry, it's the case that the best people often do their thinking away from work, and we wanted to capitalize on that fact to benefit our organizations, our staff, and especially our students. I'll have a further update in our September meeting after our uh, annual advance meetings. I also want to add that today we uh, began more work that will be that we'll discuss in our September meeting. And that was uh, Steve Cordigan, who is the data guy for District 214, the second largest high school district in the state, and one of the most influential people in uh, in his field. Uh, probably the most influential guy in the field in the state. Uh, regular contact with uh, the state superintendent of schools. Uh, he joined us for a meeting today to look at what metrics we should be using, uh, defining what we value, and then how we can measure it. And one of the interesting things was how many things he added to the conversation that were new bits of information for us. So a vast array of experience and, and knowledge that we now have at, uh, at, at our disposal that we're really pleased with. So uh, with that, that ends the superintendent's report. Thank you very much, Mr. Simic. <clears throat> now we will move on to public participation. A word about public participation before we offer it. The Lake Forest Boards of Education welcome public attendance and participation at all meetings. It is hoped that by utilizing these guidelines, participation will be maximized both in terms of fairness and organization. After being recognized by the board president, interested speakers should come to the microphone and state their name and address before addressing the board. Each person will be limited to a maximum of three minutes to speak. Everyone has a right within reason to be heard respectfully. Members of the public will not be allowed to speak a second time until all members of the audience who wish to speak have been allowed to do so. Public comments should not be redundant and all comments should be directed to the board and not the audience. To provide accurate responses, detailed questions posed to the board during public comment will be listened to and taken under advisement. The public is always welcome to meet with school officials to receive information, discuss ideas, or express concerns. If the public has any letters or other written materials, they may be handed to the board clerk for public record. Thank you. All right. As we move along, trying to probably, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. He told us the rule. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Lemke. Would anybody here like to approach the podium? This is public participation. Seeing none, we will move on. But thank you, Mr. Lemke, anyway. Okay, now we're going to move on to reports and discussions. <clears throat> so. Our first report will be from the board committees and the board education committee chaired by myself and um, fellow members Jeff Folker and Beth Clemenson. I will report the minutes. The education committee met Monday, July 14th from 9.15 to 11.35 a.m. <clears throat> Present were Beth Clemenson, Lauren Fagel, Leslie Fisher, Jeff Folker, Lorraine Grieve, Sudhar Krishnaswamy, Kelly Jackson, Susan Milsk, and Lori Wilcox. It is important to note that typically the Education Committee does not meet during the summer months. However, with much change going on, um, Mrs. Fagel was gracious in organizing a meeting and the community and additional staff members were gracious in giving up their time. First, we discussed summer curriculum work. There was a progress report. Atlas curriculum mapping software has been available for nearly 20 years. While teachers in 67 have maintained documents that have curriculum by grade level and subject, this will allow changes to occur in real time, all in one place with parents and wider, the wider public, students, and staff having access. This Atlas curriculum mapping software that we are incorporating into our district will benefit new teachers, teachers changing grade levels and subjects, and give, offer clarity for parents and students alike. Summer curriculum time will be devoted to updating this Atlas curriculum mapping software on an annual basis. And this program will be overseen by Mrs. Fagel. Kelly Jackson also joined the meeting 
and shared the work of the Cherokee staff regarding the inspiration block and the advanced language acquisition block. On June 23rd, kindergarten, third, and fourth grade teams, and including the lead science teacher, as well as representatives from grades one and two at Cherokee, met to plan for the upcoming year. In mid-August, the whole staff will come together to review and focus on habits of mind, something that we as a board focused on and learned much more about during our visioning process. Examples of habits of mind include no quick answers, empathetic listening, and metacognition. Habits of mind are emphasized in problem-based learning. They are emphasized in the Common Core Standards, the Charlotte Danielson evaluation process measures these habits of mind and best practice recommends them. Using project-based learning model will help kids become better questioners themselves. It is aligned with the Charlotte Danielson teacher performance evaluation and project-based learning has authentic driving questions, thematically based units, very different from a traditional project unit and it is measured with a rubric. One of the examples um, that was shared at the meeting that I think rang and resonated with Jeff and Beth and myself, and you can add in here if you like, was the idea of typically when we think of a project-based unit, you picture, you do a project, you work with groups in class, maybe you finish off with a field trip. Think of sort of, and it seems to be that the flipped classroom is used in many ways uh, nowadays. Think of instead, the unit's going to be studying Chicago first thing we're going to do is we are going to take a field trip down to the city. We're going to see some of the spots down there. Then when we come back, we may split up into groups. Some people may work individually. Maybe there was something that sparked your interest. Maybe you want to create an itinerary for travelers coming to Chicago and some of um, the main sightseeing, the tourist spots. Maybe you really want to focus on the Chicago fire because you're very interested in the history of Chicago. It, so there is a driven question created by the teacher under this model, but as the project percolates, things are generated by the students. Did you want to add anything, Beth or Jeff? Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Jackson also talked about um, the notion of inspiration share nights for Cherokee beginning next year, and there will be a Board of Ed presentation in September regarding the advanced acquisition um, block and the inspiration block. So we'll look forward to hearing from Mrs. Jackson at that time. Uh, we touched base a little bit on the Jay McTeague workshop. Jay McTeague is an Understanding by Design co-founder. He presented to our staff recently, and I believe Mrs. Fagel will follow up with that at our at next Education Committee meeting as we did run long on time. But we look forward to hearing about that. The math curriculum update. The Bridges program will now be expanded to the fifth grade. Grade six, that we just, as we have discussed in the past, we've talked about how certain grade levels have to be scaffolded in order to get our students through Algebra I by the completion of Deer Path. So grade six will be the year of scaffolding in order for students to complete that. Um, the text used for seventh and eighth grade algebra for Core, Explore, and possibly Quest is Pearson 2015. And the math teachers seem very comfortable with this text and confident in it. Agile Minds online curriculum, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Fagel, will be discontinued moving forward. Or no, it will still be incorporated, but it will not be the crux. It will be a supplement used within. Um, and I think that the teachers felt that this was best for the kids, to focus more on the text, but to supplement with Agile Minds when needed and when appropriate. Can I ask a question on this? Yes. Can somebody remind me, how does Bridges fit in with Explorer and Quest? Is it all? And how about Explore? Does it apply to Explore? Explore will be using some of the Bridges curriculum, and so they're going to be kind of blended. Core and Explore are becoming more like this. So because Bridges is brand new this year in fifth grade, um, we'll see how it works with Explore. Um, but we're making sure that they have access to the materials when ordering, ordering for, uh, if you teach Core or Explore, you're going to have Bridges materials. And they'll have the professional development that goes along with that. As an incoming fifth grader. 
Is that your question, Rick? Yes. Okay. All right. And speaking of which, then our next topic of discussion was enrichment, explore, and quest update. So <laughs> I may be answering your question here. Um, the third and fourth grade explore math will use bridges three, four, five, a combo therein. Placement at the elementary level has little wiggle room at this point. The daily replacement program um, may cause gaps, which is why the wiggle room has been modified. Uh, the program does grow for for Explore and Quest in 6th and 7th and 8th grade. There has been perhaps a feeling in the past that if you were not in a certain level by the time you hit 5th grade that you were never to move. And I can certainly tell you that children do move and will continue to move within 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. How does that work? I'm just trying to understand based on what you just said and what Lori just said in fifth grade, if you're in Quest, you're doing sixth grade work. How is it that you're not shut out? How does a kid catch up? I don't, I don't understand how it works. Um, well, for our kids that, that end up moving to, moving to us and Dr. Wilcox, could you go to the podium, sir? You may just want to stay there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, for our, w I think the best visual that seems to make a lot of sense to people is we start out in kindergarten with enrichment, K1 and 2, so you kind of hit your, we're kind of, it's very needs-based and informal based on kids that need some, some advancement to keep growing. Our goal, that growth notion, it's growth for all. We want all kids to be growing regardless of where they're entering. So we collect data and when kids need something more and different, we, we enrich them. But when we have this daily replacement program in third and fourth and fifth grade, the funnel kind of narrows because if you're going to take kids off level, you really want to make sure that you don't create gaps. So we really want to, if we're going to have kids in a daily replacement program outside the scope of the core curriculum, we want to make sure they really need it. Um, performance is not the key driver at that time. We look at some other factors um, around aptitude and the way that they're thinking. When you move up into sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, performance becomes the main driver because that's what matters in high school. It's all about performance. So for those kids that are working really hard, sixth, seventh, and into eighth grade, if they can handle more rigorous curriculum, we want, to, we want them to have access to that. So I can tell you with absolute certainty that um, the group and that the lovely thing about seventh and eighth is they have the same teacher that loops up with them. So seventh grade teachers, if they feel like there's a group of kids that can move to Quest this year, I believe we have eight or nine moving into Quest Math and the same for Quest LA. So what they do is they give, now your, the, the curriculum is off level. So for those kids to make the move, they do have to close that gap. So the kids that are moving from seventh grade Quest Math to eighth grade Quest Math are watching flip videos all summer. They're making a really significant commitment to do this learning on their own, and they will have to take an exam and, uh, and work with the teacher and show that they've mastered that curriculum in order to move in. Now, they have ample opportunities to, uh, to mass. It's not if you don't get the mark today, but basically their teacher met with them and shared with the parents, here's the learning that needs to take place over the summer if you want to make this move. And um, so there's, there's more ownership um, and, and responsibility and onus on the part of the kids at that point. And again, that's more of a high school model um, as far as performance. Be, you're you're going to have to do the work um, if you want to be working at that higher level. Does that make sense? Yes, generally. Uh, and did you also say core and explore? Are they sort of being blended together? <laughs> Core and Explore, um, what we, you know, in all the conversation, this year, working with math, um, our focus was really on core, but we had a lot of conversations about Explore. And one of the, one of the conversations that came up was just the, the, how important it is to try to keep the curriculum as parallel as possible so that if a student does need something more and different in order to grow, if you're off sequence, it can make a shift really difficult. But if we can keep them more in line and more similar, then we can have kids go where they need to be in order to grow. And it, and it doesn't, um, something we've done as adults doesn't impede the, the, the opportunity to get them into a place where uh, they can have the access to that higher level curriculum. So they're looking at aligning, and that'll be a beautiful thing about Atlas when we get the curriculum mapped out. You'll see, here's what happens in core. 
it also happens in Explore, and Explore might just go a little bit deeper. Um, so again, if you made that jump, you would see what needed to be covered in order to be prepared to be successful in Explore. And similarly with Quest, and here's what it looks like in Quest. Again, what's the gap? So we would know what would need to be covered in order for a student to, we never want to put a student into a place where we know there's going to be a significant gap because they've missed core curriculum. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilcox. You're Very well explained, clear. Okay, in addition, um, the committee did review the curriculum for Core Explorer and Quest Math Tracks in mm -hmm. middle school. And um, we were reminded that there will be a high value on local assessment, meaning our MAP and NWEA tests, um, especially during this transition while Common Core is changing the tests that we are taking. There was no public participation, and we did adjourn at 11.35, and our next meeting will take place at West Campus Tuesday, September 16th at 8.15 a.m. And I know, Mr. Borkowski, you had requested to see the minutes from this. There were no additional handouts, so I'll email these to you. One other education question, and I don't know if where else to ask it. Um, I read today about the state making the ACT optional. Uh, where are we on the park? Are we, are our kids taking the park this year? Is that... Thank you, Ms. Fagel. Now that the Illinois state budget has been approved, they're finally finalizing some plans. So students in grades three through eight will be required to take the park summative assessment, which is comprised of two parts, what they call a performance-based assessment three quarters of the way through the year, so around March and an end of year assessment that takes place 90% of the way through the school year. Um, our district will be utilizing the opportunity to take this, the tests online. Um, districts that are not equipped to do that will have the opportunity to use paper and pencil. Uh, the budget did not allow for grades 9, 10, and 11 park testing. And so right now the directive has been given to high schools that students who are in courses aligned with Algebra 2 or English 3, junior level English, uh, will take the park. So uh, that still has some problems with determining which students, but for District 67, all students grades 3 through 8 will take the park exam. The formative assessment opportunities that would actually make a lot of sense in terms of getting feedback earlier in the year for our kids and our teachers, those aren't ready for 2014-15. And those will be available, they say, in 15-16 for a cost. So at that time, we'll have to really look at that versus MAP and make a decision in terms of um, what's best for our kids and always with an eye towards avoiding over-testing. So we're, this upcoming year, we're doing MAP as well? Is that correct? Okay because the formative assessments are not available for park. So. so how many days of testing will the park um, require? Because it sounds like they'll be doing something in, in March and then maybe something again in May. And then of course we have MAP mm -hmm. in September and again in May. So it mm -hmm. just sounds like a lot of days where our kids are going to be assessed as mm -hmm. opposed to learn? learning. <laughs> So it varies for students. Uh, the amount of time increases as the grade levels go higher, and it's in two subject areas, English language arts and math. And it's anywhere from six to 10 hours of testing over the course of several days. So it's, um, there has been a lot of pushback on that from districts all over our state and other park states. Uh, the other major consortium in the country, Smarter Balanced, they do have a slightly shorter assessment. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's still a lot of uncertainty and um, skepticism about all of this coming to fruition. There's a lot of watching and waiting, and that's why we keep our emphasis. I consistently send the message to our teachers that we keep our eyes on the prize, which is our students and our community they each only get one chance to go through each grade level. We're not going to put so much emphasis on something that might happen. Um, we have a long, lo long history using MAP. We have longitudinal data. Our families, our teachers, and our students are accustomed to it. So we're going we're gonna to keep our emphasis there, and then the rest will just kind of go with the flow. R remind us, we don't have to take PARC, right? We do. 
Oh, we are obligated. We I lost do. track of it. We do. We do. So Park is replacing ISAT. Oh, yeah. So, so it's not optional. No, it, the it, formative <laughs> assessments that are optional, which are not even ready for next year, but the summative are required of all public school districts in Illinois. Correct. ISAT is now done. We're just getting our scores in from this last spring, and so those will be reported to you in the fall. And both the 75% and the 90% assessments are required. Yes. And Mike, I don't know if you have a sense for this. I don't know. As I understand, there was a large number of superintendents who wrote a letter or something to the Illinois uh, School Board. I'm not sure if we were part of that, if we were not. Is that fight ongoing, for lack of a better word? Or, or do you see this sort of as a done deal for now? It's a done deal for now. Essentially, the letter was uh, received with a uh, thank you very much. It's interesting. And with a, I uh, would call a pro forma response. And so for this year, with the, the approval of the budget, the matter is essentially settled. There remain a large number of really significant questions. And Mrs. Clemenson pointed out one of the most significant ones, particularly for high school, is the very substantial amount of time that high school students are going to be tested. And there are a number of issues with the reliability of the test, the consistency of the cohort groups that they will be assessing, and the willingness, uh, in particular, in high SES communities for students to participate in something that has absolutely no discernible impact on, on their college acceptance. So with ACT, even though it was a very flawed instrument in a number of ways, it was the best thing that we had and there was real skin in the game from students. And with, uh, with the, the move away from that, there are any number of really significant challenges. And, and a final one I would say is in terms of learning, the most productive of the assessments that we're going to give would be the formative assessments which are not yet ready. Uh, so students actually learn the most from something that is not a high stakes test. And that would, at, at the high school level, that would be an additional chunk uh, adding to an already very large palette of testing time. And same for the elementary and middle school, but it, it's, it does lessen, the amount of testing does lessen in, in those grades. But there, there are a number of real challenges. Um, anything to add to that, Mrs. Fagel? Just the one area that I would say the area superintendents, you know, in their efforts, did they did get um, action as a result was that they really pushed hard for the state to continue to fund an ACT for juniors. And that is taking place on March 3rd. There will be an ACT plus writing as an option for public high schools in the state, of course, um, our community high school will take advantage of that. That's, that's a great opportunity for our students. Um, the work keys is also optional, provided at no cost to districts. Um, our district at the high school level will not participate in that. So and th and that, that was a direct result of the, the lobbying on the part of area superintendents. Yeah, it's, it's a very good point. One of the things that uh, superintendents were uh, most uh, worked up about was uh, the ACT was administered, but without writing. In effect, that was a, a, a perfunctory exercise for students because it couldn't be counted without the writing. So now this is a legitimate full ACT that will be administered. And that, uh, w while it's, it's not exactly what anybody would have wanted, it certainly is better than what we had in the past and also uh, something that is, is useful. The ACT is, and talking to Steve Gordigan today, the, the data guy, uh, he's very clear that the, the ACT is the best predictor that we have at, of future college performance. Um, college preparation, likelihood of success at college, that's the best current instrument that we have. PARC is good in many ways, but it's untested, right. and there's just a lot of learning that has to go on there. So do you anticipate still the vast majority of our stu high school students will be taking the ACT? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we will offer it on March 3rd, and I would be shocked if anything less than 100% of our students took advantage of it. But it's no longer a graduation requirement. There's no makeup day. There's, no, um, there's a lot less pressure for the school. Um, for the students, because it includes the writing, 
it will now be useful to them for all college applications versus some that you know wanted the writing and the so I mean, most of our students take the ACT many times but for schools that are have a high rate of low um, SES students this was really really important and so I'm glad for all students in Illinois that the state is continuing to fund this. So will they also be required to take a park exam? Yes. Okay. Not all juniors, only those enrolled in courses that address the Algebra 2 standards or the English 3 standards. And that's where there's still some clarification that we're waiting on. I mean, it's, it's, it's laughable at this point that districts are holding off on testing plans, calendaring, you know, mid-July. And so uh, all of my colleagues in surrounding districts, we've all taken the same approach, which is stay focused on what works for our students, local assessments that our teachers develop or we use and we know with our students. The rest, we'll take it as it comes, but we don't want our kids to lose out in the middle of this very messy transition in standardized testing. Thank you so much, Ms. Fagel. All right, we're going to move on now to the Board Finance and Operations Committee. Mr. Schuler. Thank you. The Finance and Operations Committee also met in July on the 8th. Uh, consisted of the usual suspects along with Elizabeth Hen uh, Hennessy from William Blair. The primary discussion was led by Ms. Hennessy. Um, dealing with the opportunity for refinancing of the 2004 and 2005 debt certificates. Uh, that'll actually be an opportunity in January of 2015 on the call date. The 2004 debt certificates total four and a half million, the 2005 debt certificates 2.8 million. Uh, they can be repriced um, as of January 1 and as of today where interest rates are, or I should say as of July 8th, the potential savings were about 500,000, so not insignificant. <clears throat> the present value happens to be about 500,000 as well because there's no time value of money given where interest rates are. Um, due to the Dodd-Frank bill, it was uh, also necessary to approve the pre-engagement letter allowing William Blair to serve as both our financial advisor and underwriter. You'll recall we approved that at the last board meeting. Uh, the point of this was it saves time and uh, fees, and given our confidence and long history with William Blair, there was uh, no concern about that. That said, we did have a discussion, and we will monitor William Blair's um, analysis and suggestion for the refinancing and the rates that they come up with. We, uh, comps will be looked at by Jennifer and Alan. The second topic was summer projects, um, primarily concerning uh, at Everett, the asbestos removal and the tile replacement, which is completed, and also the pavement work, uh, which will be done in July and August, that's at Sheridan and DPM. Third major topic was the budget itself. Um, at the very highest level, I'd just like to give you the revenues for the 2014-15 year. Uh, are 35 and a half million, just to give everybody a sense of it. Expenses are virtually the same at 35.3 million with a projected net surplus for that fiscal year of about 150 or $200,000. So what does that mean? That means um, that's a good thing. We're not running a deficit. We did for a couple of years. Uh, back in the leaner years, right now we're back to a uh, uh, a surplus, albeit smaller, but given our overall surplus, that's kind of where we want to be. Ty, uh, well, I will highlight um, that's the big picture, but there are variables that will have an impact one way or the other that are um, difficult to impossible to project. Uh, Jennifer and Alan do uh, update it on an ongoing basis. Some of the biggest variables that have an impact on the surplus are, number one, uh, a change over time in the state revenues and the requirements for uh, pension sharing, uh, the costs of the pension and, and, who sh and how much we share in that. 
the expectation is that state revenues will decline and our requirement for sharing in the pension costs will increase over time. Uh, estimates for that are phased in each year uh, over the five-year budget and thereafter. The second large variable in the budget, projected enrollment, that of course has a big impact because salaries constitute 75 to 80 percent of our costs. Um, in 2013-2014, the enrollment was 1,913. That declined by 42 students to 1875 for 2014 and 15. To put it in uh, more perspective, we've lost 229 students in the last five years. That translates into, of course, number of teachers, and, and that a, has a big impact on the cost side. How that trend continues, does it flatten, does it go back up? We can ask Jeff about housing trends and, and things like that, but that will have a, a, also a big impact over the next five years. Third uh, large variable is what will be the final number for life safety required improvements. We have not yet heard from the state, have we? Jennifer or Alan? I, we still haven't heard. So that, you know, that's potentially, uh, you know, could revolve around a million dollars plus or minus, so that's a big variable. And uh, one last big variable are planned initiatives and the timing of planned initiatives. For that, <clears throat> we thank uh, Lori and Lauren for their input. And it's yet another example of how the Education Committee and the operations and the finance all tied together. In, uh, in this particular meeting, we did discuss and we all appreciated hearing about the latest initiatives on the instructional side, uh, one being the addition of more math specialists. The Education Committee is more uh, aware of this, but for us it was even better to hear it. We're looking at adding three more for a total of six, but incrementally three more. And um, more of an aside, it was interesting to hear how we're moving from more of a coaching philosophy to an intervention philosophy. On the reading-writing side, um, we pay for new curriculum and one new specialist, bringing the specialist to a total of eight. Uh, STEM and inquiry, um, there will be more uh, incremental costs on that. A new smart lab at DPM West is already budgeted. I think that's $180,000. Um, the discussion was we would, is that wrong? That's what I'm trying to say. DPM West is scheduled, and we had a discussion of having a second one at DPM East, and from our perspective, we said, you know, regardless of 180,000, once it's tested, and if it's, if everybody seems to like it, we would like to push up the one for DP, uh, DPM East. Why wait? If we like it, let's get it in there. And I think that was encouraging for the education side to hear. So you have our blessing. In fact, we're, we're pushing, we're pushing. <laughs> Great. Um, the inspiration block was discussed and uh, also the addition of two emotional uh, workers, uh, social emotional workers in both the west and east wings. Social and emotional, <laughs> not just emotional. <laughs> Rick, just so I'm clear, and I don't know if it's Rallon or Lauren, so the 7-8 STEM lab is going in in August, and the 5-6 STEM lab is scheduled to go in in December. Is that right? So after that meeting, we followed up with Renee, Tom, and Judy Epke, and we all agreed that um, we want to be thoughtful about the planning um, and make sure that the space we choose and the course we choose, and most importantly, that we're, we're ensuring a, an experience for students that varies enough. Um, and so taking all those things into consideration, we were, we were hoping for a December, um, optimally it would be winter break installation on the east side for students to begin taking advantage of it in January. Correct. And, you know, we expect to learn something from the first one that we can apply Absolutely. to the second one. So yeah. I, I do like, or we all like the idea of staggering it, yeah. but without a big delay. Yeah. 
Yeah, we don't want to rush, but we all feel very confident that we won't be disappointed. Great, unless there are any questions, that's all I have to say. I just had a question about enrollment. Um, is that a final number? I know last year the enrollment was projected to be lower than it actually turned out. We wound up having a lot of folks um, joining the school district over the, the summer. Are we expected to see the same kind of trend this year? Or are we feeling like you know, 1875 is where we're approximately going to be? As my grandfather used to say, it's not over till it's over, right? So that is, there'll that certainly be change. Uh, we're right now still using projected enrollment numbers for 14-15. Um, for I mean, I know we still continue to get numbers. We actually added a section, the half-day section of kindergarten as of this morning. Um, so we are still watching some of those things. Um, and that really is probably the biggest variable um, is our incoming kindergarten. And we also pick up a ton between kindergarten and first grade. So we're kind of watching um, those numbers as well. But right now it's still based off projected numbers. We've, we've had declining enrollment every single year since 06, 07, even though, yes, less, last year was less than we had projected. It was still a decline. We're, we're actually down 382 since 06, 07. The year I arrived, I'm sure it's a coincidence, but we are down 382 since that time. Hey, Rick. Uh, in accordance with uh, the policy that we passed two months ago relative to the fund balance, what's our aggregate fund balance percentage as of the end of the fiscal year? Um, I did not calculate it, but the actual surplus, well, first of all, it's projected, and it, it's only 159000 so it's a bit of a rounding error. No. Or are you asking where did we end last year? Yeah, the, the policy was to take yes. a calculation on June 30th as to what the actual expenditures were versus what our overall fund balance was and look at that as a percentage. And I'm just curious, Yes. do we know where that ended up and if that between 10 and 15%? <laughs> in your board packet, in the financials, there's a page uh, that's labeled the 2013-14 fund balances summary as of 6-30, um, 2014. And there's a footnote. Do you know what the number is? <laughs> yes. Uh, last year we started with a fund balance of 5.4 million. The packet shows an ending balance of 7.6. Now that will come down some um, because we don't have all the procurement card things posted, but it was a substantial increase. Now I want to talk about that then for a moment. When we adopted the budget last year, we projected the fund balance to grow by 1.3 million in part because we still had held off on some capital projects. And I'll talk about that as we go into next year's budget and I give the presentation. So when, when you adopted the budget last year, we had projected that the fund balance would grow by 1.3 million. It's actually gonna grow by about 2 million. So that delta, that difference of 700,000, more than half of that is coming in the special ed tuition line. And then the other couple hundred thousand is just spread out across, you know, revenues came in 15,000 higher here, 10,000 there, and expenses came in a little under in various line items. So we feel really good about, you know, the projected budgets and where we landed with various things. Special ed tends to be a very volatile area to project. So some years we win, some years we lose. But the fund balance went up, and then according to the policy in September, what we will do is at a finance meeting, we will incorporate the budget and roll out the five-year projection and then address the questions that the policy asks us to address. So based on what 
I'm looking at, does that say that we ended the year with an aggregate fund balance percentage of 20, almost 22%? Correct. 21.8%, is that right? Yeah, because okay. you divide it by roughly 35 million. Yeah, right. Yep. Okay, so in September we'll talk about how we're going to address the overage and what drove that and all that fun stuff. Exactly. Okay, September's great. a month, and that's where it'll be nice to talk about more of these educational initiatives and capital expenditures and great life safety. We'll have okay. more numbers on those. Perfect. Thank you. I don't know if you're able to address this, Alan, but from what the inference, from what you just said, is it because our special education payments out are less this upcoming year that we have this additional money? No, for the year that just ended, we didn't spend as much as, as we had budgeted. It was less. It was, it was significantly less. And that's less. because of less payments with um, students going to separate places to be educated? I think it's a combination of things. It's that, it's um, some, I believe, teacher aids uh, from, uh, that we brought in-house from an SSED that helped us underspend. And then in our salary line, we were able to absorb that um, to our benefit. I'd like to add that this is a good problem to have, that we're up to 22%, I love it. Um, Mike and Lori and Lauren should all be very pleased to have that, and this gives us room for what I call both hard and soft costs, you know, and the physical property, the labs, and, you know, the teachers, the specialists. This gives us room to play with, so. But, and, and that'll have to be presented in September, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Rick or other members of the Finance and Operations Committee? Seeing none, we will move on to the Policy Committee. Mike Borkowski. The Policy Committee has not met since our last board meeting. Uh, we need to meet soon. Eileen has told me that there's another press package, so I'm sure we'll have a report at the next meeting. Thank you. We'll look forward to your report. <laughs> Compens As always. That's correct. Uh, with bated breath. <laughs> Compensation Committee, Mr. Lemke. To everyone's surprise, the Compensation Committee did not meet. Okay, another one we will look forward to hearing from soon. As we move on to liaison reports, the North Suburban Special Education District, NSSED, Mr. Borkowski. The NSSED board has not met since our last board meeting. Uh, it meets next on August 27th. Thank you. Um, Illinois Association of School Boards, Ed Red, Mr. Anderson, there has, was no report given um, by Mr. Anderson. The Curriculum Coordinating Committee, Spirit of 67 Foundation, and APT meeting all did not meet in the prior month, all are reported by myself, and I look forward to reporting in September on these meetings when these um, groups reconvene. One change to remind the board of is our executive APT meetings. We, are, we have agreed upon the fact that we are going to rotate meetings this year, um, just for a variety of reasons that we've discussed in the past, and I want to make sure everyone's on board with that. And I'll be sending out an email shortly to get a gauge of when you are available. Okay. All right. Any other liaison reports? Seeing none, we are going to move on to action items. First, we're going to go to the adoption of the resolution to display the tentative budget. Mr. Albus and Mrs. Hermes. Thank you. This presentation was one of the main topics of discussion at the Finance and Operations Committee meeting that was held on July 8th. And there will be four components to it. The first will be a review of the legal requirements for budget adoption. In other words, why are we presenting it tonight and by when do we have to adopt a budget and what steps do we have to go through? 
Second one, we'll talk about some very high arching budget assumptions, how we approach it. We'll, we'll address things that Mr. Schuler has already touched on, pension cost shift, SB 16. Uh, we'll go over a summary of the revenues and expenses. I'll touch a little bit more based on the earlier discussion on fund balance, uh, a couple more comments on that. And then we will go through and talk about some of the budget highlights, both on the instructional side and on the facility side. Just some of the mechanics of the budget. We are required to adopt a budget by the end of our first quarter of our fiscal year. Our year does run July to June, so we do have to adopt a budget by the end of September. But prior to doing so, um, and the reason that we're having this meeting tonight is, well, we're having many for other reasons, but the reason we're having this presentation tonight is we must um, adopt a resolution to place the tentative budget on display for at least 30 days. Um, and I'll give you the visual on that. We actually prepare the budget in two forms. We do have the state form, so you'll see that at your place tonight, which is the exact required form from the State Board of Education. We also do an in-district form mat that we call kind of our budget book, which does slice the data in just a little bit of a, uh, of a different way. As Alan mentioned, uh, we have not finished uh, posting uh, quite everything yet from our fis last fiscal year, so there will be an adjustment on the state form when we do the final, because that does include cash on hand and fund balance numbers. So there will be a slight tweak to that once we finish posting. Um, we also are required to schedule a date and time for a public hearing of the budget, as the board does not meet formally in August. Our um, tentative hearing will be on September 23rd um, for that approval. And we are required to publish in a newspaper of general circulation, um, some old school language here, notice of that public hearing. But we also do make that available on our website. Anyone um, in the community that would like to come in and view our budget is welcome to do so. They would just come to the district office and um, could review any of the documents that I referred to earlier. Some of the assumptions that we use in building the budget on the revenue side, revenue falls into three main categories. Local revenue is primarily made up of property taxes. And once the levy is done and the extensions come out in the spring, uh, it's just a matter of how much the collection rate will be. And in Lake County, it's almost 100%. So that's fairly easy to do. Other things like interest earnings, we look at prior year. We look at trends in the market if rates are going up or going down um, and, and make adjustments there. On the state level, you'll see I have a bullet there that says FY14 prorated levels maintained. Um, earlier today, Mrs. Clemenson sent an email and asked why did we see a decrease in state and federal revenue and that would seem contradictory to that bullet, but they're really not because in last year's budget we actually received in some cases five state payments and now that the state is caught up we've made that adjustment to go to four so we've made the assumption to stay at the the same proration levels as last year and uh, but then had to account for that fifth payment not being there which is uh, the primary reason why why if you look in the the book that Jennifer referenced you'll see a drop uh, as Mrs. Clemenson had SB 16, which was passed um, and then challenged in court, as we were building the budget, that was the law. Um, but then the injunction came, so that, that is not included in here. And the pension cost shift, which we've talked about numerous times over the last year or so, we have not included in this budget, because for that really to take place, I mean, theoretically, the legislature could come back in November and pass it and make it retroactive or make it start on January 1, I think that's highly unlikely that they would do that. So because they didn't take action on that in May, we did not build that into this year's budget. But when we meet in September and go through our five-year projection, we do still include that. We believe something is going to change, whether it's the funding mechanism for state revenue or the pension cost shift. I, don't, I personally don't believe both will occur, but I think one of them will occur. Uh, and we can, you know, we can flip a coin and pick which one we want to work off of. But tonight we're talking about the FY15 budget, and again, so you know, the uh, SB16 and the pension cost shift are not included 
and I think it's very unlikely that that would occur during this year. The federal level, federal revenue is a very small part of our budget. All federal revenue is either vocational or special ed, um, and that's based on prior year expenses and grant allocations. All right, expenditures. Salary and benefits, um, by far and large, are our uh, greatest expense. Um, our money is invested, you know, in our in our labor and our staffing. Uh, we do take a look at that projected enrollment. Um, and I think I've stood up here before and said, okay, I have a couple of classes that are on the bubble um, that we're watching. A few more kids in the, in a few specific classes at a specific school might tip us over. This morning, prior to, to where we ended, I would have said that about kindergarten. Um, that did eventually uh, look at the numbers today and did tip. But overall, I think we feel really good about where some of the other numbers are. There is some room for growth related to enrollment. If we were to get you know, three more fourth graders at Everett, we don't see that there's a lot of classes sitting on the bubble, which is a, a really good place um, to be. Um, so we do look at the projected enrollment and staffing um, that, um, that correlates to that. Take a look at the negotiated agreements. We do have contracts in place for both the LFEA and the SEIU, which covers the majority of our staff. Um, those individual expenses are done by individual. So I have every single name of every single employee, and I know, you know, what their educational experience is, how many years they've been in the district. You know, are they moving? Is there an available step in lane for them to move to? Um, we take a look at what we know people have put in for lane changes. So did they get an educational advancement during the year? Um, have they submitted that they think they may, may hit one before the start of school? And we try to include those, uh, as much of that as we possibly can. At the time that we put this budget together or finished this budget for that, I think, July 8th or 7th, whatever that date was, Finance Committee meeting, we had 16 and a half open certified positions, which is a large number of positions at that time of the year. Um, we have monitored it since. I know that there is a huge um, group being hired tonight. Um, so we've tried to kind of balance those, and I've taken a look. How far did they vary from where I had um, projected that they might be? I mean, I kind of look at trends, kind of look at our hiring history, and make an assumption about where I think a new hire might come. And right now we're right in, in range of that. Some are high, some are lower, but overall as an, an average, we're in a pretty good spot. We do the same thing in regards to the benefit costs um, that you see on there. Obviously, we know what our individual plans and premiums are going up, but we also have an open enrollment that occurs in May and June. Um, in addition, all of those new hires may elect to take health insurance, and they may not. They may take family, they may take single. Um, so we have some assumptions around that as well. Um, we did have 22, um, I received this information this morning, 22 changes with our existing staff through open enrollment. So people electing different plans or um, just making changes. 14 of them were, went um, that changed to a lower cost plan and the remaining chose a more expensive plan. So again, it's just balancing those out going forward. We will keep track of this. We call it round two in the business office. So any changes that come in either on the hiring of new staff or people electing different insurance plans or maybe a lane change that we didn't anticipate, we kind of collect that data in one spot and we will make a determination coming into September were there enough changes that occurred either on the plus or the minus that's going to greatly swing the budget that we have on display. And if it's we win some, we lose some, but really we're ending up that our budget is in a, in a really solid spot and there's not that much variance, most likely we wouldn't recommend a, a change um, prior to adopting that um, budget in September. If we do have a wide variance coming in, like you know, perhaps every single new person took full boat family insurance, which I wouldn't have projected because it's different than the trend, maybe that's enough, excuse me, enough of a difference that we may make a recommendation to adjust, adjust that budget number. We can make an adjustment to this tentative budget up until the time the board adopts it as final on September 23rd. Um, salary recommendations are just anybody that wasn't covered under a current collective bargaining agreement and the board took action on those in June. So those would have been included uh, as well. For the remaining budget items, um, purchase services, supplies, capital outlay, other and tuition. Um, really these come from a variety of sources. Every principal um, will work with their, their staff and they do present a building budget. Every department has the same responsibility, technology, buildings and grounds, the business office, 
curriculum, special ed, and primarily these are where those numbers come from. We also look at what are the historical numbers, what are the trends, what do we know, utilities, you know, what's happening in the world of utilities, those type of factors. Um, we add in the planned initiatives, which we will hit um, when we do some of the budget highlights later, and then to some extent revenue stream. Um, and that really has to do with some of the capital projects. How many things, one, can we handle project-wise, but also, two, what can we do revenue stream-wise, um, which may affect us going forward. As Alan mentioned the tuition earlier in our discussion, that is a huge variable. It's very student specific, the special education tuition. There are years where I, I will stand up here and tell you, you know, we, are, we blew the tuition line by half a million dollars because we had placements that, you know, needed to change or we had kids coming in and out of programs or we had a new enrollee that had a placement that we didn't even um, could imagine that we would get. Um, this year it, it happened to swing the other way and, and, and um, we came in under budget, but that is something that we work really hard with special ed and trying to count what we actually know. And then trend-wise, do we usually see one additional student needing a placement? Is there two? And how much of a cushion do you build in or do you build no cushion? And then just try to see, you know, do we, do we win or lose on that particular issue? So that is a huge uh, variable expense that we um, make the best assumptions on. As Mr. Schuler talked about earlier, this is a summary then of the budget. You can see the revenues of thirty-five million four sixty seven eighty-seven, and expenses of thirty-five three hundred one zero sixty-two, net of any transfers. In either case, including transfers or without transfers, the the difference between revenues and expenses is a positive one fifty-nine seven twenty-five. So now that's different than what we talked about on July 8th because of the inclusion now of that second lab in, in there. I do want to point out, though, uh, a little bit, because given our earlier discussion, last year's budget had anticipated revenues exceeding expenses by $1.3 million, and this year's budget drops it down to $159,000. So that, that could raise flags. But if you look at the capital projects budget here, the expenses of 1.3 million, last year the capital projects budget was about 409,000. And to the board members who were elected last year, if you remember, we sat in this room during your orientation and we talked about for several years we had held off on capital projects because of what had gone on with the economy. We needed to spend time last year kind of beefing that plan up we're still waiting to hear on, on the life safety costs. But some of that work, we rolled out a new format, we identified some projects, and a big, a big piece of that work this year was the abatement and replacement of all the flooring at Everett School. Um, we're doing the Deer Path blacktopping, the Sheridan blacktopping. So that, that surplus last year was a little bit artificial um, in the fact that we, we consciously held back for several years, projects don't go away, and, and they're there. And so that's, that's, that's why that gap closed so much. And then some of the, the staffing that we've added that we're going to touch on here, some of the other things going on, that's why it's gotten much tighter. Can you confirm that um, life safety costs are not zero in here? Your, your best estimate is in here, is uh, it not? Uh, no, they're not in here you now. You have none in there. Because what will happen is sometime this fall, and I hope before our September meeting, we'll get the estimate from the architect. Right. But that work won't really start until next June. So it will really impact next year's budget. Uh, okay. And that will impact, it will impact the five-year projection first. But isn't it in the five-year projection, an estimate of it? Or do you actually have zero in the five-year? I have to go, you know, we have that capital projects plan. I'd have to go back and look okay. at that right well, now. Well, it's not in this year's budget. It's not so in this year's never budget. Never mind. No. So but you don't have numbers, but did you get the results of life safety since we met? No. They've done the walkthrough, um, and they, as architects, now go back and look where we're out of compliance, um, and then they'll start costing those things out, and then we'll build schedules off of that. The floor of that, That's a big number. I mean, that's... It, it could be. It could be. I mean, I it hope could it's not be. too big. But you know, I I want to be optimistic in the fact that I think we do a pretty good job maintaining our infrastructure. But yeah, codes change, 
And you know, if, you, if we have to replace a lot of doors, doors are expensive. Um, every 10 years you have to have an architect walk through your building and do a certification. Irrespective though of the life safety, what we embarked on this year at Everett with the replacing of the, the abating and the replacing of the carpet that's 15, 16 years old, we need to do a Sheridan, we need to do a Cherokee. Now, uh, Carol White did a really nice job this year of, of planning this out and scheduling it, and we got lucky in the sense that we had no concrete issues at Everett. What I mean by that is when, when you abate sometimes, you can, it, it can be crumbling and you have a lot of repair work or you have too much moisture in there. That wasn't the case, and um, we have no administrators at Everett right now because the building's empty, uh, but if you get a chance, stop by. Um, the flooring there looks really spectacular. It really enhances the environment, um, and I think you're going to be proud and, and pleased with what we do. And we're, we're anxious to get going on the other two schools. So we're gonna, we would like to talk in September about tackling both of those next summer, but then it comes down to the, you know, the cost and what the impact on the budget, and we'll have those discussions. But I did want to point that out given the earlier conversation. So again, you know, in one year this line went from about 400,000 up to 1,369,538. And we're going to see numbers like that or higher the next couple of years. Uh, could you clarify, uh, first a, a compliment to uh, both Mr. Alvis and uh, Mrs. White. Uh, Everett is stunningly terrific looking. and. If you get a chance to go over there, it's, it's a combination of the colors, the materials used, it's very warm. It is such a significant improvement. It's, it's really re remarkable. The second thing, could you clarify where we are in the life safety process and the timeline associated with uh, that, uh, that process? Okay, so we were due for the life safety survey this year. So the architect and their team came through I think late spring and they walk through all the buildings and they identify projects. Then they retreat back to their offices and they check codes and they, they cost out and give us uh, cost estimates on projects and they bring that back to us. I hope to get that information to incorporate into our September meeting so we get ballpark costs. And then from there we'll build in that five year projection schedules of when to complete that work. Um, question that's, maybe that's the other piece. I think that's the maybe that's part of the answer is when we get the, that report back, they will give us timelines. Like these are particular things that must be completed within one year. These are things that must be completed within three years, five years, and just the ten years. So then, with that schedule and our five-year plan, we can lay out exactly how the projects will fall. So you've not we've not received anything yet that says we know you need to address these issues. We'll get back to you with cost and timelines later. At this stage, we still don't have anything as an output of the survey that was done. That's correct. Was okay. Okay, so we're going to move on to the budget highlights. Again, uh, we went over a lot of these in the Finance and Ops Committee. Uh, the Education Report, I think, touched on them as well. And um, we're going to start on the instructional side first. Ooh, look at that. Okay, math. <laughs> um, we've talked about our math specialists. I know this is something we talked about all year. Um, and we feel really strongly and really excited about the team of math specialists that will be serving the district. Three of these people worked in this capacity this past year. One of those was Nikki Hanneman. She was our coach at all three buildings. This year she will be the specialist at Sheridan School. And we were really fortunate to get two other stellar classroom teachers who um, eagerly stepped up uh, as candidates and were granted uh, positions to be the math specialists at, um, at Cherokee and also at Everett. And those teachers are Katie Lamberti and Jessica Volpe, all three fantastic teachers, and I know they're going to do great work in those buildings. Um, at DPM last year, we had Deb Smith working as a coach and Joan Fletcher working as an interventionist. They accomplished so much work at DPM. We want them to keep going with that work, and we ended up um, hiring Laura McDowell to be 
the part of that trio. So she'll be the math specialist. At, at all three of them will be working across 5-8 to provide direct service to students and also work with adults. Okay, uh, we talked about fifth grade bridges. Um, this, this is a, a large number, but it's really uh, making sure that we have all materials for those students in core and explore. We're going to have the teaching materials, the manipulatives for the classrooms, and also some professional development. Um, that number might be a little bit high, but again, we wanted to make sure that we can get them whatever they need to really fully implement this the way that we did at elementary, which was so successful. Um, we spent the we spent the year again. I talked about this working with the math curriculum, really talking about um, you know how we make it work with Agile Mind, and that was something that our, our uh, was uh, problematic. The scaffolding in fifth grade was really problematic. We feel really strong. We're going to continue our foundation with bridges in fifth. Sixth grade is going to be that year where we where they still use a lot of Agile Mind and blend sixth and seventh grade Common Core math for our students. But seventh and eighth grade, after you know, really trying to work with Agile Mind, they felt like for both their core and Explore students, they wanted, for the students that needed it, they wanted more practice. There were elements of Agile Mind that were really appealing to them, this idea of starting with a really big real life problem, and they found a 2015 text, a ninth grade Algebra One text that starts the same way. Um, it's got an online textbook, it's, got, it's just got a wide range of materials to uh, engage a wide range of students and give them a full algebra experience. They plan on using this textbook as a base for with Core and Explore students, and it's possible that Quest will be, you know, they'll get access to this text as well. We're rolling it out with, um, we're still in the process of deciding what we're going to purchase for next year, but we know we want this to be kind of the skeletal base for algebra for all students that are, in, and again, that, that, that encompasses our whole group. Our goal remains to get kids through Algebra 1 before they leave DPM. Quick question for you. Sure. You're, <coughs> you're calling these big expenses, the 30,000 for bridges, 30,000 for new algebra curriculum. Yeah. Is that one time? Um, or is that per every year ongoing? It, yeah, it would, it would certainly not. I mean, the, the, the first time we make the purchase, um, it's going to be the most expensive. For instance, with bridges, we have to purchase the teacher's guides, all the classroom manipulatives. Um, we're still uncertain on how many textbooks we're going to purchase with 7-8. We're still working on what that'll look like. We want to get an online license so kids can access the book at home. Um, but will we get a class set or will we buy a book per student? We might kind of enter in and then have another expense next year. So this was, um, we know we have significant expenses here, but whether or not it'll reach 30K and would it be that amount every year? Absolutely not. Does that help? Sort of. So <laughs> it, it, it's closer to a one-time expense? It's I closer would, to a one-time expense. Yeah, it's closer to one, yes. The, right. the, the um, replacement cost with Bridges, for instance, would be the consumable book that would be purchased every year, but that's a much more, uh, that's a lower expense. So that's good, and it in my good. mind, it's not that big then. If right. it's every it's year, an it's, investment it's a significant then, number. Right. If it's a one-time yes. expense, that's not so yeah. bad. Okay, good. Hey, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Wilcox. Oh, or Laura, Laura, can you hear me? Uh, just relative to the mass specialists, I think that's great that we're able to put one theoretically in every building. Right. Um, and this isn't the place to necessarily answer this question, but something to think about. Adding these to the mix, I, I would just like to know at some point how do we know that they're making a difference and how do we or how are we able to truly understand the impact that, that that these positions are making and justifying for lack of a better term the expense and that that's a question i believe that came up at the finance committee um which is you know that's it's it's i think we're we already feel responsible for making sure that we have results but it's always good to be reminded that you know what it, what is the outcome going to be we expect to see increased numbers of students in that northeast corner of the map data so kids who are not only achieving but growing um, and then of course lower numbers in the other quadrants um, that show lack of growth and we also expect to see more students who are given the opportunity to perhaps access a more rigorous, rigorous curriculum so like Lori was describing making that move from core to explore or explore to quest widening the funnel making that opportunity um, more more easy for them we also will track number of students receiving interventions and look at those individual students and their growth not only on map but on local classroom assessments so a couple of different data points that we'll be watching to see the impact and again the specialist role is defined as primarily 
direct intervention with students, secondarily coaching for teachers. So moving on with instructional highlights, uh, last year we began the exploration of um, adopting a new language arts literacy reading and writing curriculum. This is a, a multi-year process. Um, it's, it's not like it used to be where you just order the basal reader and get all the boxes and unpack them and then teachers are ready to go. The, the ones that we are looking at are much more sophisticated and they really involve extensive amounts of professional development um, and, and uh, training for the teachers. Oops, I forgot about the clicker here. So we will be coming to you as we had planned on a timeline we presented last year in November recommending what we're calling a phase one of an adoption. So when you're looking at reading and writing K-8, we're going to chunk it out so that it's happening over the course of several years. The dollar amount there would incorporate materials and professional development. We added a reading specialist at DPM West, which rounds out our reading specialist staffing. Uh, looking at the number of students who are not making adequate growth or not meeting standards in reading in grades seven and eight was a contributing factor to this decision. Um, we feel that many of our students would still benefit from direct intervention beyond what they're getting from their classroom teacher. In the area of STEM inquiry, we're extremely excited about the addition of these smart labs. One thing we talked about at the Finance Committee was how um, this, this purchase feels good to all of us because it's very visible and it's very, um, very much representative of everything that our new mission and vision encompasses. So looking at these um, modules that students will participate in, they're hands-on, they're inquiry-based, they're real world, uh, they're student-directed, teacher is facilitating, um, literacy skills are incorporated. It's, 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 really, it's really exciting, and so we hope to then speed up uh, the adoption of that on the east side as well. Our inspiration block planning is coming along really well. Implementation next year at Cherokee will be in kindergarten for full day students, as well as all students in grades three and four. Um, a, a further update I gave at that meeting was just to remind uh, the board that currently the full day kindergarten students enrolled in the inspiration block, we have a, an exact even split between students choosing the language acquisition or Mandarin inquiry uh, inspiration block and the STEM inquiry inspiration block. So that's, that's really, um, it, it's reassuring that, that this is a hard choice for parents, which is what we wanted. And I think that nice even split will even further our goal of reducing that divisiveness and bringing the community back together. And then finally, in the area of response to intervention and special education, we did um, go through a comprehensive review uh, by Dr. Elise Fratura. And this summer, we are working hard to basically um, go through that report line by line, prioritize uh, things that we need to do sooner rather than later in terms of shoring up everything from our processes and procedures to our what we call our tier one, our core teaching for all students because response to intervention and special education all of that begins in the classroom with all students general education so um, that that is a, a, a big undertaking and again the the dollar amount there would be uh, for staff development related to those recommendations this was by far the most exciting part of the finance and ops committee so. and I'm not biased I'm just saying <laughs> Can you just clarify one thing for the um, inspiration block and the advanced language acquisition block? The exact split is for incoming kindergartners, correct? Thank you. Somewhat related to that, and I don't know who this question's for, but Jen mentioned the kind of different classes that are on the bubble and if there's going to be need another section. Um, as wonderful as I and others think the inspiration block is at Cherokee, there still are, as some of you know, some very unhappy families at Cherokee, uh, and some of them have asked for permissive transfers um, and have been told you can go to Sheridan but not Everett. When do we, so if there's sections, I heard Jen say that, that we're in a good shape that a number of them are not on the bubble. When do we 
give those family respect and, and if a section isn't going to go over and they want to go to Everett versus Sheridan, right. what, what does that timeline look like? Um, we can make call. We will make calls actually tomorrow about Everett. The, the half uh, half kindergarten section was added at Everett. We posted that for today. The number the numbers just tipped. So we're we're basing it on um, on incoming enrollees. If another so the the other um, problematic grade that's really at just at capacity at Everett is second grade. So right now we cannot allow permissive transfers to Everett because if we allow one, we literally have to hire another teacher because we tip it over. If someone moves into the Everett boundaries in second grade, we will have to add a third, t uh, a fourth, t pardon me, a fourth teacher. Um, and if we do that, then these couple of people that have requested permissive transfers and are, are waiting, um, now they were granted a permissive transfer uh, one to, to Sheridan, so that's where they are now, but for, you know, they're, they, they had specifically initially requested Everett. So we're just watching it, and if it tips over again like it just did in kindergarten, we'll let them know, and then as long as there's space, we can grant those permissive transfers. There's, please, this is meant as a question. There's space now, we're just reserving the space in case people move in. Is right that a Right now, uh, are you talking about second grade? We're 22, 22, and 21. We have one spot. Um, so again, it's, it's that, and, and, and it's very typical and very probable that one, two, or even three kids can move in over the course of the year. So that also makes it a little bit difficult because again, for the existing Everett families, if we grant these transfers and go just to capacity or over and then a new f person moves in, now they're sitting at you know 23 kids in a class and it gets, it gets dicey when you grant permissive transfers and then again, go over capacity. Um, so I think we're that was that was the recommendation just to you know again if we get a move in and we're at capacity then we'll go ahead and tip it. In the spirit of Mike Semix representing those who are not in the room, the alternate perspective is that the 15 or 20 Everett families who have been granted permissive transfers to come to Cherokee for the Mandarin block. Um, an alternate perspective of those not in the room is that's a bit of a double standard. I think they were, I think, again, they were all, I mean, part of the per granting of the permissive transfers, it was always under the assumption and, and always worked within the, the, the boundaries of having room in these classrooms. Well, None of those classrooms. There's unlimited permissive transfers from Everett to Cherokee. For the Mandarin program, you're saying? For the program? And I, I from our understanding, it wasn't initially considered a permissive transfer. It was considered enrolling in a program in the district. And that's an important, um, that's an important difference. So that's something that I think we need to further clarify. If we use the phrase permissive transfer to describe kids coming from Everett or Sheridan into Cherokee, then you're correct, it's a double standard, but in the past, it hasn't been considered one. Um, so we, we need to, to clearly communicate that language and the definitions. Um, I was wondering, uh, I was at the finance meetings. <laughs> I thought you guys told us that the Smart Labs cost 180, and I understand we're having a second one now, but um, either could you just explain what's in the 500K? Is there any salary in that? Is it all equipment? Um, it, maybe I'm remembering wrong. Nope, you you remember it correctly, but the and and those are two two different things. Yeah, 180 is what we had listed here as the initiative, and we actually had in the budget for that one smart lab 250, and that allowed for um, anything you know Carol might need to outfit the uh, rooms. It also would allow for flexible furniture. The 180 is the actual acquisition of the smart lab system. So 180 was the initiative, but 250 is what I had in for that one lab to cover all of those other things. There's no salaries, but it is finishing the room for its appropriate use. So, um, and then when I updated on this, I thought really I should include the total cost of all those things and I put 500 in for two. That memory is scary though. <laughs> so. Moving on to the um Facility improvements, we've touched on a lot of these, so I won't spend a lot of time. 
uh, the abatement and replacement of flooring at Everett at 320. Now that's the number we had used in the spring that we had projected. The bids came in lower, but we stayed with the projected number because there are unknowns. Um, and now we've been lucky on this project and haven't incurred them. So hopefully we're going to underspend that. But having said that, it's possible that we could fail some proof rolls on the replacement at the drive at DPM and that project goes over. So we do try to be fairly middle of the road in how we make assumptions around the unknowns. Uh, we touched on the fact the replacement of the main and the side drives at Sheridan. Earlier, I think in May, April or May, you approved a bid for the replacement of gym lockers at DPM. And one of the components on our capital projects plan, our five-year capital projects plan, is uh, now a security component. And we're looking at different products, different things that districts are doing. And one of the, there's been a committee that's been formed and they met and they talked about a number of things. One of the things they settled on was the installation of the 3M security film, uh, which goes on the front doors and the windows, which makes it much more difficult to break through those areas. So that, that's been included in this year's budget as well. Alan, could I dwell on that for, for just a minute? Um, this, the security film is something that uh, Dr. Weimer wound up learning about in the course of her, her duties as the security person, the point person for 67. Uh, she looked into it, started uh, processing whether this would be a, a good uh, solution for us. What is so interesting about the security film is it, it's not bulletproof, but it makes a, a window unimaginably hard to get through. So you, you can literally hit it with with everything you have and it's going to take you five or ten minutes to get through giving law enforcement time to get to the facility so it's really a relatively inexpensive solution for us um, and i think a, a really smart inter uh, step at this point a, a very significant and and hardly even visible i don't know if you, the windows don't look any different once you put this on there so really a, a, a smart upgrade, I think, to our security procedures. And that price covers all buildings? Uh, I believe so, yes. It doesn't cover every window in the buildings. They're starting with the main entrances and, and the access points. Uh, and then, then we'll assess and, and go from there. What we've just presented to you tonight or laid out tonight is really the cul culmination of work that's occurred in the Education Committee, work that's occurred in the Finance and Operations Committee, discussions at, the, at Mr. Simic's cabinet meetings, discussions at administrative board meetings. So it truly is a culmination of work over the last 12, maybe 15 months. From my perspective, I think it's a very balanced budget in the fact that it addresses both instructional and facility needs. Uh, and the fact that the revenues slightly exceed expenditures because there are unknowns that we have to deal with um, is, is very good. So we recommend that you authorize placing this on public display and we establish, and I didn't write the date down, I believe it was September 23rd is the date for the public hearing and adoption of the 2014-2015 budget. Thank you. I want to thank both of you for giving us such a detailed presentation here. This is something that obviously is a very important role of the board, and um, we take it very seriously. And for those of us with less financial acumen than others, it was very, very well explained. So thanks very much. Thank you. Moving along, I... Do I make the motion here? I think they want a motion, yeah. I'm going to ask for a motion to display the tentative budget. So moved. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Fowler. Mr. Schuler. Aye. Mr. Folker. Aye. 
Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Motion carries. Motion carries. Great. And now we are going to move on to the 2014-2015 calendar with addition of the two late start dates proposed for DPM. If you'll recall, Renee DeVore and Tom Cardamone joined us. I believe that was the last two board meetings ago. Thank you, Mr. Folker. And um, they are asking for two late start dates in the upcoming school year. And Mr. Simic, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. The proposal before the board at this time is for, uh, a, in addition to the calendar, of two late start dates for Deer Path. And one of the things I've uh, discussed with uh, board members I've spoken to one-on-one uh, -on -one at this point is, in terms of professional learning, we'd really like to have a, a much more ongoing weekly opportunity for professional development. In this case, there are uh, only two late starts that uh, are before the board, and those are for a very specific topic. One of the things that uh, both uh, Ms. DeVore and Mr. Cardamone have been talking about for some time related to their staff are the fact that the two sides of the building have different schedules. And one of the things that uh, comes into play there is that when a student wants to participate in one activity on one side of the building, they can't, uh, they, they, they can't wind up uh, taking advantage of things on the other side. So our ability to, to have staff move between buildings, one of the pinches in the schedule is for if a student wants to be in band and also participate in a tech class, they can't do that. And that unfortunately creates a situation where we have a student being discouraged effectively from participating in a, a really desirable activity such as band or a really desirable activity such as a tech opportunity. So we'd like to have those things be possible uh, for, for all students uh, to a greater degree. So that is the outcome, uh, the processing time that would be used for these late starts. Along with the, the late start uh, uh, in addition to the calendar, it really brings up an opportunity to revisit some of the frequent conversations that uh, I've had with parents in, in our community and also obviously I think that, that many of you have had as well and that is some ongoing consternation uh, or to put it uh, more mildly, ongoing interest in uh, moving away from half days and uh, questioning the instructional value of a half day as opposed to a full day of instruction. So we took this opportunity to take another look at the calendar and say, are there some things that we could do that we could uh, reduce some of our half days? And also, uh, one, of the, one of the important things is that this particular calendar, we have a large number of breaks that follow hot on the heels of winter breaks. You have a two-week winter break, and in the, in the two following months, basically, there are very few full five-day weeks. Uh, so the strikeout on November 14th would be, and this is the, the proposal before the board at this time, is to eliminate a half day of student attendance and make that a full day of institute day with, the, with no student attendance on that given day on the 14th of November. And so we would make up that student day later on in the year. Uh, January 16th is currently an institute day. The strike out there would turn that day, January 16th, into a full day of student attendance. So one of, the, one of the issues there is winter break, as you can see, ends on, uh, we come back to school on January 5th, and uh, 11 days later, we had a, a day scheduled off, a four-day weekend. That in and of itself is not entirely to be avoided because Martin Luther King Day is a non-negotiable day off of school statewide. But then 
again, a short time later, we have President's Day, another extended break, and then a short time later, yet again, still in February, we have parent-teacher conferences. So in, in discussions with, uh, with each of you individually, one of the things that I think we need to do related to this longer term is to take a look at the half days of parent-teacher conferences and then also the intent and the practice of those parent-teacher conferences. What do we want from them? How do they currently function? Are the half days necessary in that time? Uh, is the structure of the parent-teacher conference, is it, is it creating the desired outcome uh, for our staff and for our parents? Uh, most importantly, is it, is it addressing the student need? Uh, from my perspective, I have long always actually been a, a great fan as a teacher, as an administrator, a principal uh, of parent-teacher conferences. I think there are very few times in the course of a year that parents get to impress upon teachers. My life revolves around this child. The sun rises and sets on that child. And as I used to say when I was a principal, uh, if you come to, to parents to question, hey, my kid's a senior, I don't really need to come to conferences anymore, what I'd say is, do you think you're more likely to get a call if your child has a really significant personality change, if you've got a relationship with a teacher, or if you don't have a relationship with a teacher? And the answer, obviously, is of course you will. So of all the things we do in our life, the most important thing to us are our children. And so it's an opportunity for parents to learn more about their child from the person that, in many cases, spends more time with their child than they do. So particularly in elementary, that is the case. So uh, I think that we can take a, a, a longer look at our parent-teacher conferences uh, for, the, for the upcoming schedule, uh, upcoming calendar, uh, for the following school year, not this coming school year, but the one after that. We should be in a position by that time to have processed this some more. I would not recommend a change to that conference schedule this year because as so often happens, there's, there are many facets to this. And if we make a change without uh, having a chance to process this both with our union and also with our parents, uh, we'll probably wind up making a change that uh, had unintended consequences. And, um, so that is what is before the board at this time. I think the overall direction is uh, a, a desire to move away from half days wherever possible, maintain uh, five weekdays to the extent possible, yet also provide breaks on occasion through the schedule that really do benefit uh, teaching and learning and also families need to get away. Three really quick related questions. One, what's the minimum number of days that, of instruction that we're required to provide? Um, two, uh, how many days do we provide based on this calendar? And three, are half days considered a full day of instruction? A half day is considered a full day of instruction. Uh, you have to have four in-service days. That's a state uh, requirement? That's for that, that, is that a contracted? No, those, those are, you can't have more than that uh, in a calendar. Um, uh, so uh, the number of required days. 176 student attendance days. That is the minimum. And then, of course, you can have as many beyond that as you want to. And how many does this calendar provide us, including the half days? Right on the money? Right. 176. All right. Mike, you talked about with some half, with some <laughs> you talked about looking at the next year's calendar and the parent teacher conferences. When is that brought before the board? I, I seem to think it's September, October. Can anybody give us an answer? So as we're talking about the calendar for 1516, you mentioned you're going to look at parent-teacher conferences. Uh, and 
I'm reiterating something that you and I have talked about, but I would mm -hmm. encourage you also to look at moving professional development to the summer and the tri-district day, for example, that it's a little too late in the game now, but it's not too late in the game mm -hmm. for next year. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we talked about is, and, and we've had some experiences with this at the high school uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, this last year because of snow days and the year before because of a minor interruption to the school year. Uh, is the value of the the time after school for professional development so after the school year ends it's really the only time when teachers don't have something that is pressing on them so any other time that we do professional development with with our staff kids are coming got to get my room got to get the room ready got to work on all these things at the end of the school year there's really a big bang for your buck uh, for that so uh, that's something I'd, I'd really like to see us uh, expand where possible. And my other comment, just for those who weren't on the call with you, is 46% of the Chicagoland schools have the Columbus Day waiver and have school on Columbus Day. We are part of the 54% that don't. That's we are in the majority. Opportunity. And that's another opportunity. Yeah, on Columbus Day, there the the our ability to to. Uh, change Columbus Day for this year we could we could do that uh, it is part of our SEIU uh, labor agreement that Columbus Day will be a holiday so there's some some uh, things to, to to work through with that if we do ever want to change that also there are some re required days from the state uh, Martin Luther King jr. being one of those basic point is, is in September we're going to be asked to vote on the next year's calendar. We're going to go through this conversation again. Right. Uh, I'm hoping that there's be fresh more significant mind. changes. So. I just, as we're looking at new calendars, would ask that we also look for synergy with 115, um, given you know that we have a shared services model and we're one community. It's difficult for for those of us who do have children at both districts you know friday november 14th the high school is in session but friday january 16th the high school is not in session right. and so therefore as you know families are planning trips or whatever you, you're going to be yanking from one or the other place which i think also hurts a teacher's ability um, in her classroom to work with the kids so is there any reason that we, is there a specific reason we are not swapping, that, can, that we cannot swap those dates? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm just wondering if there's a specific reason that we cannot swap those dates, where you would keep the, the full day on November 14th, and you would, in, you would go back to using the Institute day for Friday, January 16th. Yes, if we had the, the Friday the 14th as a, uh, full day uh, for for students the 14th at the high school that's an in-service day at the high school correct right so uh, at the high school on the 14th that is a uh, that's an institute day for uh, for them so if we had a full student day but that's not what what you were saying Beth right it's not on the calendar if it is okay Go ahead. Yeah. So originally when this calendar was designed and presented, I reviewed the memo from Paul Siminski. And at that time, in an effort to align with the high school, Friday, January 16th was a day off for both districts. Here we are now, more than a year later, making some late in the game recommended changes to accommodate the request to really make an effort to move away from the half day. So the change that you're seeing proposed for Friday, January 16th is in order to eliminate a half day overall. And we were able to eliminate the half day on November 14th and replace it with an institute day. So and it, without adding to the end of the school year, we took it from January 16th. Actually, there is another way without adding to the end of the school day. Beth's comment and my comments are not mutually exclusive. They can be perfectly consistent, have both districts have to school, go to school on both days and do the teacher conversations during the summer. If they, they can go to school, both districts can go to school November 14th, 
both districts can go to school January 16th. You can end the school day, the school year earlier in June, and you can do professional development in the summer. You don't need to add in June. You can add during the school year. Everybody can go to school between Labor Day and Memorial Day. We'd have to pay our teachers to come afterwards. Correct. And, and yep. it would be difficult to require them to be here unless that was something that was... I think that in the contract, as I've been told, we can require them up to a certain number of days, five days, ten days. There's so, so there and certainly I, are other alternatives. Yeah, I think a change that significant without... Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, one of the things that is particularly important is these in-service days, uh, in this case, um, uh, earlier in the year, there's so many initiatives that, that we have going on. We really don't want to move away from the earlier, uh, early in the year in-service time. Uh, the high school has got a new tech initiative going on, and I mean, they really want to have every minute they can get to do that. I understand, and I'm, I'm trying to tie what Beth said, which makes sense, with that 60 days from now, we're going to look at a calendar from a year from now. I understand that school starts in 45 days, yep. but I also understand in 60 days, we're going to be presented a calendar for next year. I really hope that we don't have the same conversation again, because we the will. Part of the problem is <clears throat> the timing of the approval of the calendar, and I know some of us have been struggling with this for yep. many years. Yep. When we have the discussion, it's always it's too late because this was approved six months ago. I, I'm really glad to hear both here and I know other discussions that you're aware of some of the community's concerns, the board's concerns about the disruption in the momentum and the continuity of the school days. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was um, highlighted and exaggerated last year because of the snow days, but it oh, yeah. became ridiculous yeah. after a long two week break. First of all, you have a long one week break for Thanksgiving, then you have more disruption, then you have two weeks for Christmas, and then we had a series of yeah. three and four day weeks, whether it's a snow day, a half day, a teacher institute yeah. day, and <clears throat> that's, that's not good. But I, I stepped back and I just, I segregated the calendar into days off for holidays and breaks. And there's another category for early let out days. And there's another category for late start days there's another category for institute days, and there's another category for teacher conference days, and there's another category for half days. Some of those overlap. Some of the half days overlap with teacher conference and institute days, some don't. But it, it, I, for years I've been feeling like it's the boiling frog problem. It's like, well, this day makes sense, and this is why. And this day makes sense, and this is why. But when you put the whole calendar, calendar together and you look at how many full weeks and months of education we have, and how many days are broken up by half days, we need to start from square one and just give the whole thing a lot harder look. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I know from the top there's uh, um, support for that, mm -hmm. but we are tired of hearing it's too late, we can't do it. I mean, we're, we're, adding, we're adding late start dates at the last minute. And, and we're doing it after as well. So we are, we are. Net, net, these changes add no school hours to kids. Zero. Can I just throw one suggestion out for your consideration for this coming school year? So the high school has parent conference day on November 6th, and then Friday, November 7th is a no school day. Given that that Friday, November 14th day isn't tied to anything in particular, would it be possible to do the Institute Day on the same day as the high school, the Friday prior, November 7th? The eighth grade class does go to Washington uh, on the 14th, just saying.
they don't often take time to step back and take a whole different look at it. And mm -hmm. I understand that that's what you're asking us to do, to really, to really come at it from a different lens and look for a much cleaner, more consistent, you know, calendar. So and and we, we don't want to have a debate on the value of institute days and teacher conference days. It's just how and when. It's not if. But that's not the question. Yeah. I think it's an important conversation to have. Um, and certainly, right, and I think what Rick is saying, we don't negate the fact, the importance of the, the time to give teachers to work together. It's the utmost of importance. It's just how are we going to maximize and increase the time that the kids are in school. And um, Jennifer, did you say it's 176 days, the minimum? And, and that we are at the bare minimum? It's a, that's disheartening. It's disheartening. I don't know if that's something that is contractual with the LFEA. I'm not aware of that. It, ben is not here anymore. Um, but that's something that we've got to look at when we renegotiate if that is the case, I believe. We rarely compare ourselves to CPS, but CPS, I believe, is at 202. <laughs> mm -hmm. We don't strive to be CPS, but I think they're at 202. And particularly when you layer on what we talked about before with the park testing and the extra testing requirements of that, I think it just all rolls up into your, your boiling frog analogy. Okay, so on that note, <laughs> on the table is... <laughs> um, on the table is the approval of the 2014-2015 calendar. It's really an amendment to the calendar, which includes the addition of two late start dates. And I would also add that it includes the elimination of a half day of student attendance on Friday, November 14th, making that a full institute day. And it changes Friday, January 16th from an institute day to a full day of student attendance. Can I get a motion? I move that we adopt the, I don't know, the revised calendar. Second. Second. Roll call, please, Madam Clerk. Aye. Mr. Lemke. Aye. Mr. Folker. Aye. Mr. Borkowski. Aye. Mr. Schuler. Nay. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now we're going to go on to the approval of the human resources items. One moment, please. Okay. I move that the Lake Forest School District 67 Board of Education approve the human resources items as presented. Do I need to go through each one? No. Can I ask a question on it? Oh, yes. Um, the replacement for the math teachers who became math specialists, I'm not sure 100% if they're included. I, I think they are. W are they included? Yeah. And so my question is the question I ask now every time. Were those positions posted? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they were posted. The math specialist positions were posted, and then when we filled those, so those, um, most of those were backfilled last month. So that would have been on the June HR report because we, we finalized that at the end of the school year and then immediately posted their classroom positions. Uh, the only one that took a while to fill was the sixth grade Laura McDowell's position, which evolved from just a math position due to a reduction of sectioning. That was becoming a math science position is how it ended up getting reconfigured, and that's on this month's report. And I apologize I missed the June meeting. So the backfill positions for the math teachers who became math specialists, were they filled internally, externally, both? They, they were filled ex externally. Yes, correct. So, and uh, Nikki Hanneman went from being the coach to a specialist at Sheridan, and then Katie and Jessica's positions were filled at the, there's a third grade that's now at Sheridan and a kindergarten at, at Everett. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Laura. Yes, that was presented at the June yeah. meeting. Okay, so the human resources items include hiring resignations, terminations, family and medical leave absence, and change in status. Can I do another question? 
Yes, I'm going to ask for a motion mm -hmm. for uh, the approval of the human resources items. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Madam Clerk, roll call. Mr. Folker. Aye. Mr. Lemke. Aye. Mrs. Clemenson. Aye. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Mr. Schuler. Aye. Mr. Borkowski. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now we move on to the consent agenda. This is the approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements from June 2014. Minutes of a regular meeting, June 24th, 2014. Minutes of an executive session, June 24th, 2014. And the disposable, disposal of audio recordings, December 11th, 2012. Can I have um, a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. Second. Second. Comment, Mr. Lemke? Okay. Madam Roll Call. Mr. <laughs> Lemke? Aye. Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we have two FOIA requests Sean Tong, non resident, and Adam Andre Andrzejewski, non resident. Andrzejewski. Okay, seeing as we have come to the end of our agenda before we adjourn, the announcements. Monday, August 25th is an institute day, no student attendance. Tuesday, August, <laughs> this is very fitting, <laughs> very fitting. Tuesday, August 26th is an institute day, no student attendance. Wednesday, August 27th is the first day of student attendance, and that is a full day. And Monday, September 1st, 2014, Labor Day, there is no school. Our next Board of Education meeting will be right here, 7 p.m., Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting of the Lake Forest District 67 Board of Education? So moved. Second? Second. Madam Clerk? Mr. Borkowski? Aye. Mr. Schuler? Aye. Mrs. Clemenson? Aye. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Mr. Lemke? Aye. Mr. Folker? Aye. We are adjourned.